there is horrible things happening. My kingdom is falling apart. I'm going to go fish for a while. Yeah. yeah. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, Eric, and Nick discuss the ways developer narratives can detract from open world games and vice versa. Plus, Far Cry 5, Doc's do's and don'ts of board game expansions, and more. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. Welcome to the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. I'm Jim. I'm Eric. I'm Nick. And I'm Doc. Great. And so... Uh, it's chaos without you, Chris, guys. Come on. <laughs> you know I was, I was waiting for like this sentence, actually, that he always says like right before that. And it's like, oh, no, no, it's me. Okay, no, I got it. I'm changing it up. Just flip, flipping the script. Uh, we've we got to pay attention. I think we have toes. a completely uh, a different roster today, a, a unique roster that we've never had before. That's yeah, true. I've, I've never... Well, uh, we, did the, we did a codex. The four yeah, of us have never Nick been I, yeah. uh, together Precisely. in this way. Right. Yes, yeah. that's, so who so, knows what sort of uh, hijinks we'll get up to. Yeah, you may have noticed Chris is not here with us, so all rules are just off. Yes, They're just completely off. off. Completely off. And he'll just edit us, edit us all out if he wants to. So we still have to be, we still have to be pretty nice. Yeah, so it's, yeah. The, it's the power of not having the editor yeah. here. Exactly. But, then, <laughs> but he's still going to edit it. So. Yeah. What um, are we talking about today, Jim? Well, so we're going to talk about um, how how the story might actually detract from uh, the experience of playing an open world game. Oh, wow. So, or how open world detracts from the story. Oh well, I was gonna take the maybe the different <laughs> angle, but sure, we can yeah. kind of we can kind of dance around both both topics. Um, I do think that just the concept of you have an open world game and you have a story, um, the marriage of those two is really difficult, and a lot of games simply are unable to do it, and they can't really figure out which they want to do. And clearly, they either really want to do one or the other, and they can't quite yeah. you know have that connection. They feel obligated to do both. For whatever reason. So yeah. we're going to talk about that today. There's a lot of ways, a lot of things that we can talk around for that particular topic. Um, but first, we're going to start off with the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Lately, I've been playing Far Cry 5, and I picked it up because I do consider myself a Far Cry fan, but admittedly... Um, this is a series that has caused me just as much frustration as it has enjoyment. <laughs> now, this is the one about the religious cult, right? Yes, this one is the one about the religious cult. And it actually was kind of controversial when it, um, before it even came out, uh, because the marketing campaign uh, got really political and people sort of were taking sides and, and it became this whole, this whole ordeal, which frankly really wasn't an accurate description of the game at all. I mean, what the a game, shocker. The game is, the story is is paper thin. It's not interesting. There is no connection to real world politics, frankly, at all in this game. Uh, the game itself is about um, essentially doomsday preppers, about doomsday prepper cult that believe that the world is going to end and they have to save us. And of course, the, the religious component as well, like they're going to save your soul. And so it's a prequel to Fallout. Uh, actually, it, <laughs> no, but but it is a prequel in a sense to another Far Cry game, which I'll get to in a second. Oh, really? Oh, uh, interesting. Kind of, but not really. Sort of a joke. Um, but uh, yeah, the game the game is um, does does a, does a really good job of trying to depict these cult members as really um, creepy and crazy, um, devoted but like psycho. Like one of them, for example, um, likes to carve your sins. He believes that in order to atone for your sins you need to have you physically remove them as like symbolic because that's both symbolic and literal so he writes he carves the sin on your chest or your you know skin or whatever and then he cuts off that skin and staples it to a wall things like that mm. so they go like way over the top with it which could work if the game didn't take itself so damn seriously <laughs> one of the things that frustrates me about this game is it's like it's equal parts silly and serious 
And uh, the, the way that they incorporate the storyline into the game is very frustrating. It's actually my inspiration for our meaty topic today. Um, it does not uh. does not do a good job when it comes to incorporating the, the open world, which is interesting and, and, and has provides a lot of opportunity for emergent gameplay when it comes to all the different weapons that you can pick up, which are all real world weapons too, by the way. Um, so you have everything from shotguns to pistols to sniper rifles to machine guns. Whole, a whole bunch of different types. Um, you have some really interesting melee weapons like um, shovels that you can actually throw like javelins, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, it has the Far Cry you know, concept of stealth, where you're able to sneak up on people and do ta- perform takedowns and conquer bases, take over bases, which is always a big part of Far Cry, um, where you have to travel to a new area, explore it, learn what's there, do some hunting, and then conquer a base. Who, who are you taking down so essentially you're you are a rookie cop that is going to arrest the, the leader of this cult that that's the whole first part of the game okay um at the, the introductory part i should say and um you're going with multiple other cops what happens of course is that they don't let you take him and the helicopter crashes and the person on the other line that you're calling for help has actually been indoctrinated into the cult herself so she, she's not going to tell anybody what's happening and now you're on the run from the cult members the crazy cult members and the only way you can get out is to take the three leaders of the cult down and then go after the main uh, boss of the family and take him down too. Does that mean you're just shooting all of these indoctrinated cult members along kind the of. way? You're, yes. And you're, you're, le- you're also building a resistance to take them down. So you're meeting other people, helping them. You, you're taking over bases so that they can then become the resistance. Okay. It's, there's not much story there. There really isn't. And, and, and frankly, the problem is not even that in the, the paper thin story, it's like how it presents it because it forces you to watch these cutscenes. They think they're so great and they're not. The loading times are frustrating. The way that the missions themselves will expect you to do things that either don't work with the mechanics or feel foreign to you or just simply don't work. Like keep a hostage alive, but all they do is immediately shoot the hostage if, if they if they spot you. So they force you to do stealth if you really didn't want to do stealth, things like that. Like it's like it should give you – it gives you in the open world all these different ways that you can experience the game. And then when it comes to missions, they go, no, you have to do it this way or you lose. You have to do it this way. Mm. And the reverse is too true. Uh, is, is true too. If you are really into stealth, which I am – you know, certain parts of the game, I was really into stealth before, which is like screw it. Um, but – I wanted to encounter, you know, approach missions and stealth. And there's certain missions like, no, you're not going to. That's not, you can't do it this time. You have to do it this way. And it gets really frustrating. The, the game feels like it's an open world game that railroads you. It's the best way to describe it. Um, and yet I'm still kind of trying to enjoy it because there's still parts about that open world experience that are really fun. So it's like they have, they have a good game that they added a bunch of garbage to. And I'm trying to sift through the garbage to get to the good game. And sometimes when I'm there, I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool. And then the garbage kind of piles up again, and I have to put it away for a while. And uh, But it's an interesting experience, and um, glad I've talked about it. So what you're saying is you wanted a good game, but it ended up being a far cry from that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We'll end there. It's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. The latest uh, DLC for Cities Skylines just released earlier this week. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Cities Skylines is basically a, uh, as it sounds, a city simulator game, a kind of um, retort, as it were, to the dumpster fire that was SimCity 2013. <laughs> um, when it was announced, it was, you know, it looked almost exactly like SimCity 2013, except it had all of the things that. Everybody hated about Sims 30 2013 taken out, and that was kind of the pitch. Um, but now it's kind of grown into its own game and become a uh, a uh, kind of a powerhouse of its own. One of the major things about this game is the modding community because it is, has such a huge and expansive modding community that I don't even think the developers expected to have. Um, and every time there's a new DLC, basically all of the major mods break because the game isn't quite uh, built for um, the kind of modding that a lot of people are doing. So there's um, oftentimes there's like fundamental code that gets changed and then breaks all the mods and then you can't play the game mm-hmm. for a certain amount of time or whatever. Some of these mods are like kind of essentials, um, I would say. Like they make the game a lot better. There's, you know, traffic uh, 
you know, micromanagement mods that like expand the kind of um, lackluster traffic management capabilities that were in the game to begin with and mm. just stuff like that. Um, the thing that was interesting, though, is that, uh, you know, in the community, there was the whole thing where like, oh, yeah, the DLC launched and now I can't play the game for a little while. But what was interesting was that within hours, you know, some of these mods were getting patched and fixed. And um, by the end of the day, it was to the point where like all of the major mods that I was using, save like one or two, were completely fixed. So major props to the modding community for City Skylines, because that is some uh, impressively quick working there. Um, yeah, modders can be really incredible. I mean, yeah. when they're dedicated, I mean, which all of them really are, mm. um, they can be really incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. I know like Fallout is a great example. I think Skyrim, great examples of games that have really strong modding communities too. Yeah, City Skylines is another great example. Awesome. There's there's this one um, modder who does who's done hundreds and hundreds of mods that are just relatively minor fixes to stuff in the game or m minor changes that make, you know, quality of life improvements and stuff like that. And he even had like a completely new mod out for the game day one when the DLC launched and it was like based on features in the DLC. So clearly he just <laughs> was working super hard and super fast and it's like, oh yeah, this is, a, this is a feature that we're going to want immediately. So let's have it day one. So pretty impressive stuff. What does the DLC bring to the game? Uh, the DLC. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good thing to bring up. The DLC basically adds um, the ability to zone parks. Um, basically, before any parks that you wanted to add had to be um, like four by four, like on the grid squares, sort of things that you would just plop down, and then all they, they would basically be like buildings. Mm -hmm. um, in the new version, you can actually like set an entrance to your park and then zone like like make your entire make an entire area into a park and add customized buildings. There's one that's like theme park. So it's almost like a mix between roller coaster tycoon sort of stuff and city skylines. Oh, um, cool. You, you don't get to actually build any roller coasters, but you can like, you know, place down all the buildings and all the rides and everything. There's stuff like nature reserves, um, city parks and a zoo. You can make a custom zoo and stuff like that. So hmm. You can just expand. Um, basically, the the DLC adds a whole lot of beautification options that weren't in the in the base game. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool DLC, but it's also just sounds interesting. Like it's just like the way that you kind of described it to me, like kind of off, uh, you know, before recording was uh, that it kind of became this community online effort um, of like kind of a lot of discussions between different people of fans and modders and then developers of yeah let's get this solved now that it has come out and allow people to start playing again um because because the mods uh you know just as is truth the modding community they care mm -hmm. about you know you know the game itself and yet when the developers aren't necessarily prepared to deal with some of these to integrate it you know properly and yeah they change the code base a lot that's going to happen so yeah and the uh the developers are actually pretty active in the community yeah. too taking a long it's the only way i could see this working yeah yeah like a long time ago there were some mods that were added to the game that the developers actually integrated into like patches cool. and stuff like that. So there are instances where, you know, the, the developers are taking direct input from modders and, you know, just trying to make the game as good as possible. Yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah. But this is like the fifth time this has happened where the game bre breaks. It's often completely understandable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is kind of an, an indie title of sorts, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. So. But given the size of the, the company and the dev team, yeah. Now it would be interesting to see where they can go in the future with maybe a new engine, a new a sure, sequel to the game, sure. something like oh, that. Oh well, yeah, City Skylines too. There yeah, you go. But that is a topic for another time. Ah, uh, definitely. Sk City Skylines. Cityers Skylines. There's two. City Skylines two. Die harder. Beyond <laughs> cyberspace. <Right>. Revengeance. <laughs> and knuckles. <laughs> Revengeance and knuckles. Yeah. <laughs> Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I want to talk about Rising Sun. It's a board game. It's a Kickstarter game. Uh, it's a game that has uh, followed on the heels of a few other good games. Um, there's one called Blood Rage, which I've talked about before. Um, and in many ways, it's a very similar type of game. But I have a few concerns about it. I'm not going to call them complaints. I've played the game twice. Uh, played it with six players, played it with lots of expansions, and I think it suffers from what in the past I have called 
Kickstarter fatigue, a stretch goal fatigue, that sort of a thing. And basically what it is, is that um, if you give us a lot of money, we're going to shove in this and this and this and this. And by uh, the so time... it's the feature creep of RPGs. Yes, it is the feature creep of... Well, in this case, it's, case it's a board game, tabletop oh, yeah. board game. Um and it's a beautiful game. It has beautiful, gorgeous minis. It, it's from a, a company that used to make minis exclusively, and now they uh, actually uh, make games as well. And they're doing a, a good job, but I think the, the problem is they're not effectively playtesting, rigorously playtesting with um, groups that are as, let's just say, uh, dedicated to the gaming hobby as some of uh, our groups on game night. And what I mean by that is we can really kind of break a game after two playthroughs by exploiting it. So in that spirit, um, I've, I've come up with a couple of, let's call them uh, rules, because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And instead of picking on Rising Sun specifically, which is a satisfactory game overall, I'm going to generalize. Now, uh, please understand that this comes from my great love of games and how I choose to spend my precious eight hours weekly, <laughs> given <laughs> that uh, I have literally hundreds of games to choose from out of the group's library. And I want to play for maximum enjoyment of maximum people whenever I sit down to play a board game. Uh, so I'll start with my, my personal preference uh, that I, with notable exception, prefer to play shortish games with a smaller player count unless they're incredibly fast moving. So like cooperative or uh, interactive games or something shorter than three hours like Betrayal or Hellas or Sidereal Confluence would be my preference. So um, from, from that, I am a little bit biased immediately towards games that are going to be longer. The second is that expansions that complicate or increase the playtime are often game-breaking. It's kind of like a bad DLC in a video game, right? Uh, I've often called this that stretch goal fatigue idea. Uh, and Albion is one of my absolute least favorite games that suffers from this. Uh, Firefly, I think, has suffered from this. Um, but the ones that enrich rather than complicate, like, say, Roll for the Galaxy or Mansions of Madness, these ones are awesome. So I guess to lay down what I mean by that, if a rule reads, uh, now when doing X, also do Y, that's a danger sign. Uh, optionally, do Y instead, like in Takedo, would be preferred. So instead of taking this card, you can take this card. But in, uh, in Rising Sun, it's now when you take this card, also take this god who will come out for you. And there's only four of those. And with six players, that's a problem because now four people have gods and two do not. Um, it's kind of imbalanced. So if it's a, it's a variant way to play, that's better. Okay, rule three. Pretty visuals and minis are nice, but a strong core mechanic is critical. So this is strongly related to the idea of being able to just glance at the board and read it. Uh, you should be able to just look at the table and know uh, what, like, the power of an army is. If you have to consult a card or ask the attack value of a unique figure, that is problematic past about mm, five figures on the table. And it rates closer to, a like, a tabletop minis game, Warhammer 40K or something, than a board game with figures. And when a game uses racial powers to alter the core mechanic, like Vast then that's a different kind of design. So here's number four. If a race has a correct or narrow way to play it, then the game requires loyalists and lifestyle players who prefer that type of game. Twilight Imperium is mine, by the way. I, I don't, I, all my rules are off with Twilight Imperium because that is my favorite lifestyle. I will forgive just anything if it has <laughs> TI written on it. This is offset by a very good alliance or trade mechanics or the ability to make meaningful strategic decisions from well-balanced options, but um, ultimately, you have to know what kind of game you're making. Uh, number five is that the more complicated a game is, the more rigorously tested and balanced it must be. This is a murder-your-darling scenario. Uh, it's, uh, you know, many games are being funded now that don't undergo the stress test from different groups with different personalities. Our group is that expert that is enough to break the weak game, like I was saying. So uh, in about two playthroughs, if it feels fundamentally the same every time you play it, that might be a problem. 
And then my last rule, number six, is in order to attempt sort of randomness, because this really came up in our playthrough, uh, people were like, there's nothing random about it. There are no dice. Well, um, dice are randomizers, but card decks are random sequence sets. So strategizing based on a card or an action that may or may not come out is a very specific type of game. Uh, games like Dead of Winter or Arkham, uh, but it only works if there are multiple paths to a goal or survival is the objective. Done well, it makes a strategy game robust, done badly, and the game becomes a reactionary candy land. That is all. But I like candy land. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. We're going to talk about how storytelling can actually detract from the experience of an open world game. And um, as I said early on, this topic does stem from my experiences with Far Cry 5, but it is by no means limited to Far Cry 5. This is something that I feel pretty strongly about um, plagues many open world games, often to a different degree, um, not necessarily quite as damaging as I feel it is to Far Cry 5, but um, I do feel that many... Um, I'd even go so far as to say most open world games fall into this trap. What do y'all think? Well, I, I, I would go with this thesis. You have to know what kind of game you're making. And um, there, whenever you give that open world experience, what you're doing is you're saying, here, go tell your story, at least in part. Tell the kind of experience that's going to be an emergent story based on discovery, based on interacting in a ergodic way, which is sort of meandering around. And whenever you want to or choose to, um, then you can come back to that mainline story element. I, I play lots of games that operate on that principle, like um, Assassin's Creed. Every one of them has done this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so my typical approach to that is to clear a level or clear an area and over level and then tag out the missions whenever they're just super simple uh, because I don't like replay. I enjoy the experience of the mainline missions usually, but I don't want to have to replay them. That just breaks my immersion big time. So um, I would almost go the opposite from what you said, which is that um, it's not that the, the main story missions take away from the open world. It's that the open world uh, detracts from the mainline missions and the main story if, in fact, that's what the game is really about. Right. No, I, I completely agree. I think it's like the order that you put them in ultimately doesn't matter. The point is about the relationship between them being strong enough to justify having both. And um, there's that that element of, you know, what are you really trying to do here? Are you trying to tell a story or are you trying to give someone um, this experience in this open world that you've built? And oftentimes these games, I feel it's and, – and a lot of this is because they're designed – they're developed by so many people. Um, they have a very large design team. But a lot of times it feels almost as though – uh, the ones who are developing these those experiences in the open world that don't really have a story attached to them necessarily um, are developed, you know, kind of in a silo from those that are writing the story and designing the story content and the story missions. And I think there's a there's varying degrees of that. Well, it's not like they're doing that. It's they literally are doing that. Those are separate teams. Sure. I, I just don't want to say I don't want to speak. I agree with you in a lot of a lot of cases. It is. I just don't want to to make it sound like I'm saying that for every game because I, I don't know if that's yeah. true for every game. But yes, I agree with you. Most the of the bigger time, the it, game, the bigger the team, yeah. the more likely that is to be true. Right. Uh, if you end up, I'll go back in time a little bit here. Um, you know, if you end up with a Ken Levine, for example, writing a Bioshock, what you have is a visionary who has created this very um, unique world with a very unique pitch and has the ability to describe this world well enough that he can create the levels even before or, or rather, you know, have the levels created before he really has the story nailed down. And, and not, you know, he is he's on video saying that, that he basically uh, phoned in at the 11th hour the story for Bioshock. Um, it it kind of shows in later games, especially the ones he got kicked off the project of right. um, for that very thing. But ultimately, that's the way some creators work is once they have all the assets in front of them, they can tell their story. And I get that. So. 
I guess part of it is the way they design it. Um, speaking of Far Cry, which I have not played Far Cry 5, um, you know, it, do you have this idea about a weird encampment that you're going to tell a story in and then you create the encampment and then you write the story or do you write the story and then create the levels? You know what I'm saying? You ever been to one of those places in a game where you're like, ah, this is a, this is a space where a narrative element's going to happen. It's oh. just oh, yes. too staged. It's just too perfect. It's too curated. And instead of being able to then engage in that moment, then you have to wait for the story to catch up to you to the point where you're supposed to be there. So it's like this clean, clear, empty fortress that you later have to come back to, or worse, you clear it and then you have to come back again later and clear it officially for the sake of the story. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn was was pretty terrible about that, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was about to mention that it sounded like a complaint that you had about Horizon Zero Dawn. It actually Zero was, Dawn. yeah. yeah. Um, and then there are instances where they completely lock you out of any of those stirring moments. I'm well, actually, actually okay with that. That's actually a smarter way to do it. Yeah, a good way I'm to okay do it. with that. Yeah. If it's like, nope, you can't go here. Um, in fact... 15, Final Fantasy 15 did some of that stuff. There was Absolutely. a big gate There's if you got too close. And it's like, right, yes. Um, yeah, no, yes. you don't want to come here. You are not ready. We will kill <laughs> it, you. And you walk away. It, no, if if you're you're gonna, literally you. Yeah, no, if you're yeah. going to integrate story into your open world, actually, I think the gating is the proper way to do that. Yeah. Unless it's um, GTA 4, where if you go to the other side of New York City, you literally get attacked by the police. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I thought that was well, pretty cool. If you what swam across, is, yeah. 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 Well, okay, no, yeah. if you drive across the bridge, you you get a six star or five star wanted level. Oh, they yeah. they don't they don't block it with. Yeah, uh, they typically just block it like with a bridge that's destroyed or something. Yeah, uh, I, that it's was, been a very long time. In since three, I, played four. I think I remember we in talking four, about different games here. Yeah, I remember one of them, and I don't remember which one it was. I I swam across. It was the first one you could swim in, whichever one that was. I San swam Andreas. all the way. It was San Andreas. Yeah. I swam all the way across to the other island on purpose just to see what would happen, and immediately mm. got a five star rating. Yeah. And got blown up by yeah, the FBI. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, I know. And, and you're you're right, uh, uh, Nick. I that does sound familiar for four. Mm -hmm. um, which is I'm an inter still, interesting way no to do it. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't have any issue yeah. with it either. I think I think that's a good way to do it. I think that too, um, just for those listening that that may hear us talk about story, I just want to clarify that we are talking about um, the developer story and not the player story. Right. Because um, all these open world games, even if there was zero developer story, just having that experience is going to give you that player story. So we are talking about that, that divide between the developer story yeah. and that open world experience. Well, let me take this in a kind of a weird direction that I think will tie back and it'll circle back around to exactly what we're talking about. Um, last night in, in my gaming group, my board gaming group, we actually played Fallout, the board game. And yeah. I actually really like Fallout Aren't the board you special? game. I do. Um, <laughs> but, oh, I guess you did there. Uh, but it, it, it has four, let's call them scenarios, mainline scenarios. You can play in the Commonwealth or you can play in the Capital Wasteland or you can play in the Pit or you can play um, on Far Harbor, right? Those are kind of the four. It, it's really open to expansion. They haven't done that yet. But the problem is the rules are very badly written. So it takes a while to kind of grok what it is you're doing. But once you finally get there, what you end up with is this very cool card-driven story system, which will tell you to stage the next card, and you read these very well-written, very brief little descriptions about what the next mission is, and you probably have five or six missions out that anyone at the table can go after. And that's where it kind of breaks apart, is that if someone gets a piece of information and then stages the next card, that doesn't become their mission they are following. It becomes the table's mission everyone is following. And there's a good, so let's call it, you could go after the the Brotherhood's version of that, or you can go after the Enclave's version of that, and you can, you can get points from either side, and that's part of the mechanic. So what ends up happening is there are side missions, which will get you stuff. And then there's the mainline story missions, which will get you stuff. If somebody chases the mainline story mission, the game will end. I mean, that that's just going to further, because it's built into the mechanic, um, that the little star and the little shield will go down and the Enclave will level up and the Brotherhood will level up and you will uh, end the game. And you will not necessarily win because you have to have the most victory points to do that. In order to do that, you have to do the side missions. So it's hmm. really kind of fascinating. It's it's an open world game in the sense that it's hex based. You can go anywhere in the map you want. You can actually level up. You can fight monsters. You can do, I mean, it's, it simulates the Fallout experience incredibly well within a, a tabletop uh, board game experience, but it literally has the problem we are talking about yep. <laughs> in that the, the narrative is separate from 
the open world experience and they are not fundamentally linked. It is not emergent and it is not um, natural. Yeah. And I think ultimately this is the problem we're talking about. In a film, you would never have anything akin to the open world experience. It is a problem that is native to an interactive environment. It is a problem that is native to a game, whether right. that be a board game or a video game. Because once you give agency over to the player and they're like, you know what, I'm going to wander off. I'm going to go get lost in the bush. I'm going to go uh, level up and, and grind by killing some pigs. As soon as you've made that decision, you're off narrative. Yeah. There isn't, at least that I know of, a good solution to that. Yeah, and that's actually what's really at the core that we were kind of walking around before is not necessarily uh, the development process, because I think that's what we were talking about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. um, is is kind of the issue of just simply storytelling in games and how that mm -hmm. works, like just simply in an interactive media, but then also how like that works within the confines of a studio and like kind of operations of a studio. But I think that especially when we're talking about open world design, what we actually are witnessing is a direct conflict between narrative and open world design that in, in, in which the two actually don't really work very well together. Um, true, good open world design. And I think that a part of this is due to um, just simply games getting larger. And that was once what just simply quote unquote open world became was mm -hmm. because we were, we were able to build larger worlds. And now we're simply at the point that we can make pretty large worlds very easily yeah. and what was once just levels that were separated by loading screens or some type of barrier is now just simply a seamless level mm -hmm. um it is now that all games are now open world and we yes. need to now start restricting some because of this conflict that we're getting between story and, yes. and, or, and design or possibly um just recognize that maybe this doesn't need a developer story maybe um, the open world experience itself, if you if you seed it right, um, could give rise to you know that emergent gameplay exactly. and yeah. the player story, and not worry so much about wanting to tell your story. Let the player experience their story through the world that you've built for this them. This is this is actually a core issue that Bioware is dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. um, that a lot of longtime Bioware fans like myself um, and are starting to have issues yeah. with, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially after Andromeda came out. Um, that was one, there's a really wonderful article that was written. Uh, I don't remember where it was from. I should have done my research before now. Um, that was essentially along that topic that that's, that's the core issue that they're having and that the best Bioware stories have been told in extremely linear fashion. Um, even if you look at, if, even if you look in the Mass Effect games, when story needs to happen, they essentially the levels and the missions are isolated sequences that send you down mm -hmm. hallways so that they can control that. Well, Dragon Age 2, I often argue, is the best story out of the three of them because it actually really just simply cuts down the scope of what's available to the player mm -hmm. um, and then forces them down the narrative that they want to tell you, which can be much more structured and better because well, of that. Story is a fundamentally linear concept. Yes. Even whenever you take a story non-linearly, ultimately you're either reconstructing events as they occurred uh, and piecing it together like you would solve a mystery, or you are taking the individual elements of it and your experience of how you're putting it together becomes the story, if that makes sense. So um, I, I would actually cite uh, the Prince of Persia 2008, okay, mm -hmm. tracking with me here, as being a really great version of non-sequential um, open... Not, not necessarily open world, but technically it was, um, story in that all of the elements were told like little short stories and you could do them in any order, but you had to clear an area before you could go to the area beyond that. And then the area beyond that. And it was sort of like a little tree, but you could do any parts of the tree in any order because it didn't matter. Ultimately you had to do all of the areas and then you could do the final part because what you were doing was restoring, uh, call it magical power back to the tower to save the princess or mm -hmm. whatever it was. It's been a long time since I played that one. I just remember that it was one of my favorites. And one of the nice things about that is ultimately the order in which you choose to do it then becomes the story you're telling. And the bosses you fight um, teach you a thing about everything else, but uh, it, it, it doesn't really get any harder as you go. 
And that was the core complaint at that time right. about that. You compare that to something like the the early, um, speak, speak out of ignorance here, but the early Mega Man games where you can choose which order you want to go so you can get the weapon. Yeah, that, I was actually going to bring those up. I figured you were. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're the Mega Man Well, yeah. you're talking about yeah. spoken wheel design Fan. at that point. Right, right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Right. That's exactly and, right. And with that one, there was a whole strategy to doing certain robot master stages in a certain order because there was there were rock paper scissors mechanics right. to you know um, this one robot master's ability is going to kill this other robot master in only a few hits so you mm-hmm. want to do his stage first you know etc so there's this whole concept um but yeah it sounds like in in this case mm-hmm. for prince of Persia, i haven't actually played the it's a great old game, game. It's, it's a, a ps3 game, game. It's I was great. I was so disappointed that it wasn't like Sands of Time that I still haven't played. I think that a lot of people <laughs> have that. I, yeah. I'll be totally honest. With you. Yeah. It's it's totally fantastic. honest with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just just think of it as a, a different Prince iteration, yep. a different story, and and play it. You know, when when you start talking about these kinds of games, though, you have to make the disclaimer. Technically, that's not an open world game. Yep. <laughs> it is a different solution to giving the player the agency and the freedom to not be on that rail of do this first, then this, then it's this. It's like a level, yeah, and level then, selection. Yes. Yeah. It, it kind of comes down to like, what is your definition of open world? And well, we, yeah. we've probably talked about this a couple times in the past. We have, but like, we have. Um, open world doesn't necessarily mean big swath of fields and mountains. No, and, it means you can do anything you want. Yeah. I think a Firewatch actually is being a, a great example of a tiny open world or game. Or Bully. That's ultimately, Bully's another great oh, example. Oh, Bully's yeah. a great example. Um, and, and ultimately, they're very linear when you really get down to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we probably should talk about the origin of open world as we think of it. And it's GTA 3. Yep. Yeah. You know, and and I think the reason why the open world became the open world the way we think of it is because they had this robust city that sort of operated on its own. You know, it was rudimentary, but but it it did. And then you could go anywhere in it and you could steal any car. And that those basically those three things working together yeah. made GTA this just mind-blowing experience of I can what? I can do what with what? I it, can go where with what? It, be, it became huh? this. Yeah, it became this. I think the the, the main difference there before um, we get a whole bunch of like negative comments about that's not the very first open world game. We had all these. Well, that's, while that's all true, like for example, um, you had games like Might and Magic or the early, early, early Elder Scrolls games mm-hmm, where you mm-hmm. had this giant, these giant worlds to explore. Um, it didn't like what GTA brought to it was. Um, mixing in these sandbox elements where where you're you're, sandbox. you're, you're, yes, in, like, you're in a playground you're basically in a playground yes. and, and while there's stories that are happening and there's things that you can do that are all you know that are these linear experiences developer um, storylines stories they're telling there's also this element of I can kind of go where I want and I can interact with this world in all these different ways as though it was a real place yes. and, and it's you can't just do that dangerous in enough. Yeah, and that's the key, another key. I and mean, if you've ever been in a completely safe open world environment, it gets really boring really fast. Yeah. But GTA nailed it in that if you start breaking laws, your star level is going to go up, and the cops are going to start coming after you. And if you keep to go, you know, the, then the black helicopters are going to come. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it it gets really really dangerous, but they, and that's important. That's and they, an important they element. balance that without punishing you too much, right. which I thought was brilliant. Yeah, where because you don't have to obey the traffic laws uh, like you do in Detroit. Well, I, I mean, I mean, when you lose, though, I mean, like when they arrest you or kill you, you it you're disappointed. But the because of the you're the, wasted, right? Because yeah. of the way that they handle saves, and because of the way that they handle um, where they place you after you after you die, for right. example, great. It's point. not a big deal. You just you come out of the hospital and you're like, oh, I'm okay now, and then you just continue where you left off. Yeah, it doesn't you're feel arrested or, yeah. it, you're not punished, which is I think if you're arrested, you lose your weapons. Yes, but yes. that's still but, but yeah. it's easier to get killed than right. arrested. There yeah. is a punishment. To be, I, I didn't want to say that you're not punished at all. Yeah. There is a punishment, it's sure, and there should yeah. be a punishment, but it's not to the point where you feel like you're you're discouraged from exploration and doing, like playing in the. You still get to play in the playground. I always reloaded right? when that happened. Oh, oh, I did too. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair, Sorry. and and plenty of other people did too. But my point is that like it's not this huge, hugely discouraging experience. Like say in Far Cry Five, if you're doing things that you feel like you know maybe you're exploring the mechanics a little too much, the, uh, there's a big dis. Uh, there's some a discouraging factor because well for one thing whenever you're back it places you wherever it feels like it wants to place you based on the automatic saves uh, which sometimes are not in good spots and two Ugh. the load times are hideous so you really just don't want to go through that experience um i feel like in any sort of open world game because one of the big you know 
pushes in an open world game is exploration and um, discovery, both of the world itself, but also of what you can do, how you can interact with the world. So if you don't, if you punish the player too much for doing that, you're almost kind of going against your own design. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah. And, you know, open world has become such a thing now that it's not so much about, you know, the open world design concept anymore. It's just, oh, yeah, we're making it action game. So obviously, naturally it has to be in an open yeah, world. Yeah. Or a fantasy game has to be open world. And it or really whatever. doesn't. I, I mean, um, the, the Yakuza series, I would say, is uh, a pretty good example of doing l l sort of linear correctly, right? I would say so. Right. Yeah, Yakuza, Yakuza puts you in what feels like an like it's an open world kind of but not really it it does that pretty well um it ga it gates you well in mm -hmm. terms of like where you can go and where you can't go it gives you experiences that are optional it gives you side missions that are that are interesting which is common for an open world game um but it's much more of a contained experience on purpose because it's trying to tell the story it's it's even though i've heard it compared to grand theft auto um i don't really think it's a fair comparison aside from the fact that you're in a real city and you can move around that real city because yeah. you're not in a sandbox. You cannot go up to some random person and attack them. You cannot um, attack the cops. You can't steal cars. There's a lot of things that you can't do. You can explore the world, but I wouldn't even really call it an open world game, yeah, to I be honest with you. I think people are mistaking the thematic elements that are similar. Yes, with, I agree. With yeah. the other. You know what? I would cite as being a really great game that melds the, let's call it the core narrative and the open world element second son um not including the dlc which mm. is actually a separate story entirely which i think is a great way to do dlc uh it, it actually triggers the um showdown it's called the showdown after you do a certain number of elements in the open world so you can choose what elements you're gonna you're gonna do you can uh go have fights uh, or you can go take down the little bases or you can go uh, tag signs because you're like uh, a spray painter, right? And once you hit a certain threshold of that, then the option to trigger the showdown comes. Then you can also continue and, and clear the area with 100%. Uh, now, I had some different problems with that game, like Concrete Powers came way too late in the game because I had already done all the stuff and cleared all the things. But I think the way that they integrated in, wow, this punk teenager dude with superpowers is literally taking over our city, or is he freeing it? Hmm. Uh, because you've got the whole do it well, you know, positive karma, negative karma thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think, really integrated the things that you're doing around the city meaningfully with the narrative itself. You had a reason for the bad guys to come after you because you're a punk with superpowers who is destroying the city or liberating it or however you want to think about it. So that's one that if, if you never really looked into uh, that series, I, it stands alone. You don't have to know anything about the first two games. Um, Second Son is a great game. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, one of the, cause what, one of the things that we were doing is we were kind of defining what open world is um, mm -hmm. and uh you know, bringing up, I think part of the reasons that Yakuza could be considered open world um, is it's not necessarily about size. Um, it's about how um, an environment and play space is handled and mm. how, uh, what type of uh, quests and levels are available to the player at certain given times. Um, so the idea well that said. you can do story missions or you can go do side missions yeah. or you have your own emergent elements that you can just do of just playing the game and having things happen as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then that therein lies the issue with trying to tell a good story within that, in that if you have a player and that's why Yakuza, I think restricts to a certain level more than say other open worlds do mm -hmm. is because they're still, they're, they're trying to limit as much dissonance as they can between the hero. Uh, because that's always one of the, my personal big issues with stories even having a place whatsoever in an open world game is the moment that the hero no longer does the mission that they're supposed to be doing. They are now a bad hero and not yeah. necessarily because they're uh, just, that's part of their character yes. arc, but just right. because they're yes. just literally ignoring what they're yeah, supposed like to Yeah, Like in do. Skyrim, you yes. could go kill Alduin and at the end. And therein is my issue with Elder Scrolls <laughs> are, games. Yeah. Are, yeah. are you saying that when I'm fishing in a, in a lake as opposed to trying to take down the like doomsday cult that I'm being a bad hero? Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm saying that when you're the Inquisitor <laughs> and there's a giant right. hole in the sky, if I'm just going to walk over and get a bunch of elf root, mm -hmm. 
I'm being yeah, a I'm bad picking hero. flowers. Yeah, exactly. Do, or, um, or what so, about Fallout, where yeah. you're, you know, oh, my son is probably out there, and I need to save him. But uh, no, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna go off on the side quest exactly. and do this for a while yeah. instead. Yeah. So that's why I actually argue because one of the things that you brought up early, Doc, is I don't know if anybody's figured out how to do it right. Um, I actually think that there's been one that did it, and it was Breath of the Wild. I was going to bring that up. Um, In that, at the very beginning of that game, you are told what your job is. You are the hero, and you're supposed to go defeat Ganon. You can go do that immediately Mm -hmm. if you're really, really good. Yeah. But you're probably not. And what's great about it is it captures every single different type of player type by giving literally only one goal. Um, Everything that you do in that game now reflects that version of Link's character arc. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Be it if you're an over leveler and you literally do everything in the game, if you're a completionist, everything that you're doing is making Link stronger and making yourself more confident to go try to take on Ganon. So even if you're doing something as silly as picking up rocks and finding little green guys, that still goes towards that final quest of yeah. Because ultimately, that's a really good point. The, the, right. Finding the Koroks gives you more slots for weapons. Exactly. Or whatever. Yeah. 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 And another thing that Breath of the Wild does really well, I think, is um, it has a narrative and it has a story that's separate from just you know Link takes over Ganon or takes out Ganon. Um, it has the whole story of Zelda leading up to the events of you know the Cataclysm and everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, you mean the the restoring your memory yeah exactly yeah. The restoring your memory but you don't actually experience that story in the gameplay you, what you're doing as doc mentioned earlier you're uncovering the story and piecing mm-hmm. it together and and it's also optional yeah it's completely optional. Yeah. what i like about it is that in order to do the story you have to explore it's give it's do it's giving you these uh exploration challenges of like here try and find where this picture was taken mm-hmm. I, I find it very interesting that it it came so full circle because many people were, would argue, myself included, that the very first open world game was the original Legend of Zelda. So it's interesting yeah. that we've kind of come full circle where we had this early experience. And obviously there were many improvements that were made to, to, to the concept mm-hmm. over the years. Of course, you would expect that. Um, but we've come almost full circle where Nintendo looked back and they even said this in, in developer diaries and interviews that they looked back to the original Legend of Zelda as their main inspiration for Breath of the Wild, just in a um, general design sense for that more of the experience as opposed to the exact here's, you know, gameplay itself, but more like, you know, how do you feel when you're playing this game? You know, what what are you what are you what are you doing but not specifically like what is your goal things like that and so that's really what you had in the first game now they did gate you of course in the sense that you literally can't enter ganon's palace the ninth level um in death mountain unless you have all the triforce pieces so they do have that that restriction so i'm not i'm not saying it's like a one from relationship or anything but it was a very early example and arguably uh, the first example of an open world concept. Yeah. I can't think of any earlier uh, open world the, games. Hopefully, uh, we will have someone that writes in and gives us another example. There, there, there very like a, well may be one. Was there yeah. like a King's Quest or something like that before that? Or King's Quest, King's Quest, the, would, or a uh, like not game open. Like that. Yeah. They, yeah. Those were not open world, though. I yeah. would argue, um, but but no, they didn't come before either. No. Um, I one thing too, I want to I want to point out is that we've talked a lot about open world, and we're kind of conflating sandbox in with it yeah and i think which is which is fine because a, many open world games are taking after grand theft auto uh three which was also a sandbox game yes um, and that's a big part of open world design in many of them however not all open world games include that aspect to it so i do think it's it's important to consider as well that many of the the, the challenges and problems that we're talking about related to open world design are in part there because they're also sandboxes. And so you're able to do all these extra things. You're it's able true. to interact in the world in all these different ways that maybe don't make you a hero or, or at least run contrary to the right. to the story that, that the developers are trying to tell and that you're uh, experiencing because you're playing, you know, you know Link or um, random rookie cop in Far Cry 5 or whatever to use all these different examples. Um, so yeah, I just just kind of keep that in mind because yeah. we have mentioned Elder Scrolls. I know Nick, you're a big Elder Scrolls um, fan. I, mm-hmm. I I would I would argue you're the biggest at the table. Um, <laughs> I certainly won't won't try to take that title from you. So <laughs> he knows it better than anybody right. else. That's so and, true. and I, I would say that's definitely an example of an open world, an early pretty early open world yeah. uh, game. So those going all the way back to the um, original. Oh yeah. Um, the original Elder Scrolls, I yeah. believe it was called Arena. Right? Yeah, Arena. Yeah. Is the first so one. and which I I have not ever played, but. Um, 
were open world games, but not really sandbox games. Yeah, Arena was hardly an open world game. Um, you could only okay. go from town to town by um, fast traveling. And, um, oh, so you couldn't explore to get to the other town. No. So really it was Daggerfall then that was the first. Yeah. Daggerfall. Is that when you were actually, okay. Yeah. Elements of Daggerfall were procedurally generated, oh, I yeah. believe. Oh, yeah. And that's why some of them, because it wasn't curated content, uh, some, some of the towns ended up with like bobbleheads and very, very strange mm -hmm. effects. <laughs> it was also twice the size of actual England. I know. Yes. Yeah. Which yes. is amazing. I think it's, it's the incredible. only two scale Elder Scrolls game. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. is why they did that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one of the, it's still to this day, one of the largest open world games um there, there there are a few that have surpassed it but it's still way up there in the list of like yeah, open, but i also open world personally games. i consider it more of a procedurally generated game than an open world game it's just not infinitely procedurally generated right it's limited and it was also generation. locked in uh yeah. you know for for the shipping of the disc if right. you will i mean yeah. there were constraints to it as well of course yeah um because you still did have quests and you still had story yeah. and all of that. oh yeah and the main story was all curated yeah it was and curated there's, and you there's had nothing to go to specific about places that. and find specific right. people and stuff it's just yeah. if you go off the mainline quest you're experiencing some effectively procedural content yeah well and that's still true with elder scrolls i mean with, with skyrim you if you go off uh and basically finish all the main content it will procedurally generate quests for you yeah, they're the they're the same three radiant quests over and they over are. again. You they know, are. When I, whenever I hundred percented Skyrim years ago, I was getting to the point where like, yeah, I could do this the same Dark Brotherhood quest line a hundred times, or I could just stop playing and do mm -hmm. a new character or something. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the other things, because what's particularly interesting about this, because I can go on and on about how open world should not necessarily have a story or if you have a good story to tell you should not make an open world game mm. but particularly the way that jim you had addressed this was kind of the opposite of that how storytelling can detract from gameplay yeah and i and, and again i i did it in that order because i'm thinking of far cry 5 sure. which has yeah. such a weak story and yet such a strong environment that you play in right and i enjoy the mechanics so if the reverse were true, of course, I would have thought of it from the other side. Yeah, sure. Um, and so actually one of the examples that I think also did it extremely well, um, where the story got out of the way, even mm -hmm. though it still existed, uh, was in Saints Row 2. Um, actually, like one of the examples that I often give that did GTA better than GTA does GTA, mm -hmm. um, in that it recognized what the player is going to do in this world, in this universe, uh, and created a story that justified all of the actions that you're going to be doing, gave you the type of missions and side missions that um, fit along with that tone mm -hmm. and created a story and tone that actually meshed with how the player was actually going to interact with the world. They with almost a very did weak that. story, yeah. but just, mm -hmm. and that was the very reason that it worked. They almost did that with GTA five with the character of Trevor. Yeah. Trevor is the only one that makes sense in that game. Yeah, yeah. but I, then they also yeah. give you Michael and Franklin. Yeah. And, and as they, much as I like yeah. Michael and Franklin's stories, yeah. it is also it goes in the face of what the player is supposed to do. While when I do open games. world in GTA, I only play as Trevor because it's the only thing that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I agree with. I, I, even though that, that's a good example too, because the story of GTA Five, you know, I would I would say actually was really good story. Sure. But you're yeah. right. The there's that disconnect when you're playing as Michael. Um, or Franklin that yeah. you don't have with Especially Trevor. Franklin. Trevor Trevor is like the embodiment of the typical Grand Theft Auto yeah, player. Absolutely. It feels like he's he's a player that's like playing Grand Theft Auto in Grand Theft Auto. You know, mm. <laughs> uh, it works. It works, right? Um, and of course, he's just. I mean, the guy who plays him is a great actor as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in Walking Dead, it's such a trip seeing him him in Walking Dead, yeah. looking exactly like Trevor does. He was also in Better Call Saul. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's a, it's a mm -hmm. trip anytime you see him because you're like, whoa, Trevor's here. Uh oh, something's gonna <laughs> happen in real life. Yeah, <laughs> it's like watch out. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good example. Um, so another open world game that I feel like was pretty effective. I know you mentioned Saint Rose too at making the missions all kind of fit in with with what you were doing or who the character was. Um, no more heroes. Have you played that or are you aware of No More Heroes? I wouldn't call it open world. Um, it's kind it's of really kind of I more. Was, just I was thinking about that too. Select. It's it's it kind of it's sort of kind skirts, of like along the it Prince skirts of Persia. The, yeah it skirts yeah. the line it kind of like you're right it's kind of similar to the way that Prince of Persia handles it where it's it's sort of in that gray area like it's not really an open world game but it has some elements from an open world game I guess is a better way to describe yeah. it, it has a hub world yeah yeah speaking yeah. of hub worlds though I think another and side yeah. missions and things like that yeah sure. an interesting example to bring up might actually be something along the lines of Banjo Kazooie. 
where you have like, you know, the hub world and then from the hub world you travel and there's loading screens in between places. So it's not like truly an open world in this, in the way that we tend to, you know, technologically we would consider it. Well, and that was really popular for a while. Uh, I mean, Ratchet and Clank used that same Mm -hmm. type of design. Again, that Mario Mario 64, I mean, that was the wheel design. Yeah. yeah. Mario 64 was basically the one that kind of, yeah. Pushed all these other games to come out and copy that style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's similar. It's it's very similar to mm-hmm. that what you were talking about with Prince of Persia. So I, I'm kind of getting that there may be some themes here, um, not to be confused with tone, but uh, themes that are sort of the archetypal story that work well in an open world game. For example, you've got the theme of I'm going to take this city back, or world, or whatever it is, or mm, yeah. I'm going to go conquer this. Or that that kind of a thing. Or maybe you have the, I need to get to the other side, and so I'm going to survive it. That, that doesn't work as well for me. I, One of the reasons yeah. I didn't like Final Fantasy XV is I thought it was going to be a road trip, and instead it ended up being back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and I got so confused. But then there's another one, and maybe this one isn't as well um, done uh, in that it's not as often done. Let me put it that way. And it's the Red Dead. Red Dead Redemption. Yes. You are the man with no name. Now you're Marston, but um, you know you, you, you are effectively every uh, Western trope that's ever existed. You ride on your horse into the sunset and you find adventure. And it actually makes so much sense for you to just go on out and maybe you're going to help a stranger. Maybe you're not going to help a stranger. Maybe you're going to focus in on that mainline thing. Maybe you're going to run away. And, and it I think is one of the strongest open world tellings. Yeah, uh, I would all. agree. Like, for example, you know Mexico is across, they don't call it Mexico, whatever it is they call it, but you know Mexico is across the border, uh, you know, of the Rio. You know it's there, you can see it. Mm-hmm. But you literally have no reason to go over there until you have a reason to go over there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you could go rob a train, but... Why would you do that until you have a reason to do that? And it's all right. so interwoven, so incredibly I, well that it just guides you through the world. I, I, I do feel that it does an effective job because you can be both a um, kind of the white hat or the black hat to use old Western terms. Yeah. Um, it's your choice. Or I mean, West world when, terms. <laughs> wow. Well, but they got that from old Westerns. But, yeah, they did. Of course. Um, but yeah, like uh, you, you could choose to play it either way. And even though Marston is... Um, you know, Marston's quest is really that he's out to do whatever it takes to take down the old gang so that he can be reunited with his family. You know, he's not, even though there's talk about, oh, this is kind of a redemption quest, and to an extent it is, and that's part of the title. Mm-hmm. But he's not, his quest is not, I'm going to go out and be a really good guy and redeem my, my path. No. That is not his quest. His quest is to is to take down, or bas- basically do whatever the, the government stooges tell him to do, but it's essentially take down his old... Um, gang members, gang buddies, so that he can be reunited with his family. And so um, you can justify it to yourself when you're out, say, um, robbing a bank or robbing people or what have you, because one, you used to be an outlaw, and two, um, you... um, you know, need the money. This is all going towards whatever funds or whatever thing that you're doing. It just depends on how you want to justify it as a player. I didn't feel right doing that because that wasn't the way I wanted to play Marston. Right. But I feel like you can do that. I feel like it does work within the context of the story. And um, actually, I do think Bully was pretty effective in that, too, in the sense that Good example. It's, a, it's an open world game, and, and, and Nick brought it up earlier, mm-hmm. and I, I do feel it's one of the strongest Rockstar games when it comes to the connection between story and open world as well. Um, you are in the sandbox, you can do all these things, but they're with, from the perspective of a child. So when you're, when you're say, you know, using your slingshot and shooting things or, or riding your bike and doing dangerous stunts or whatever, or picking fights with bullies or something, it's something that you, you could do as a juvenile delinquent but it doesn't feel like this dis- disconnected that it might be if you were like say Franklin going out and just randomly murdering someone that you can do GTA five. Exactly. Yeah. And, and a part of it as well, that bully added that I think helps to, uh, to, to create that harmony is um, the kind of time cycle that they have in that mm-hmm. uh, you only, you have certain times of the day that you're supposed to be places. And if you make that decision to not go do them, then that still fits within the character. You're, you're officially right. ditching class exactly. at that point. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, in a certain time, you're supposed to be back by curfew. And um, I think that that's part of the way that they're able to control that as well, is on one hand, controlling what you're actually able to do. You're not able to steal a car. You're not able to get a gun that would actually cause true harm to people. Right. But then at the same time, they also put a level restriction on you um, through through that time control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. 
One yeah. thing I think it would be interesting to talk about is kind of what we think some of the best types of stories work well with open world design um, and which ones kind of don't. Um, you know, an example of something that doesn't work well, is, as Eric has brought up, is, you know, Elder Scrolls or Skyrim specifically, where you can go through a quest and get to a point where it's like super urgent and then just like go catch butterflies for an hour before you go do that. Yeah. Being a hero doesn't work yeah. with maybe the exception of what you said about, uh, you know, Link in yeah. Breath of the Wild and I, for that reason. Yeah. Right. And I think the I think that sort of thing could work hypothetically if we were to like, if there was a game that actually um, punished you for, uh, you know, wasting time and I, there were consequences for I would drop everything. That game yeah. So I would drop it too. And I think, I think the issue, I mean, you could totally do it that way. I mm -hmm. think I think punishment is one way that you could handle it. I just wouldn't recommend it. Um, like Doc, I would drop the game. But I, I feel like what is important is not necessarily the specifics of the story because I feel like you could probably make it work with um, you know all sorts of stories if you work at it. But the key is that whatever you're letting them do in the, inside that open world – um, particularly inside a sandbox, it needs to have a purpose that ties back into the story. And if it doesn't have a purpose, that's where you get that disconnect, where if you can't justify what you're doing within, within the, the um, from the perspective of that character that you're playing, like you, when you mentioned um, Link, mm -hmm. all these things that he's doing, like like uh, when Eric brought up the example of looking for the Korok seeds, you know, there's a purpose there that ties back to that main goal. Yeah. And that's the key is to have that purpose, whether there's one main goal or multiple, I mean, which, whichever, it doesn't really matter per se. But as long as what everything that you're doing has a purpose, like for like, say in Far Cry 5, you know, I'm fishing. How does that really help fishing help with my goal to take to build a resistance and take down um the this you know doomsday prepper cult it doesn't it do, there's no connection there yeah. so when you're and same you know catching butterflies or there's no connection there typically it's not that there couldn't be it's that there was no effort put into it to, to think hmm should we have fishing it was just well we're an open world game we got water gotta have fishing <laughs> i think that uh or just we need to have more content let's just that do too. that yeah. yeah um i think that one of the things that because both doc and i provide an example of like kind of taking over the city type design mm -hmm. um a reason for why you're taking over a city or yeah saving a city mm -hmm. um something like that works uh a fantasy story in which there is a very broad goal um, kind of like a Breath of the Wild. If if Elder Scrolls was literally just, if they just even told you you're a Dragonborn and that's it, and you yeah. don't know what that means, oh, I'm so the with entire you story at that point is yeah. in finding out what that actually even I'm means. I'm so with that's you. Actually, they should have done cool. that. And, and to that point, um, <laughs> there's I, a mod that does that's that. That's perfect. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. To that point, I think another kind of story that works extremely well with open world is the concept of just uncovering something, yeah. uncovering a story, discovery. discovery. Fa Fallout, yeah. Fallout, because new, it's all Fallout about New Vegas is, yeah. for a while felt like yeah. that when you were trying to figure out you know who you were who killed who shot i mean they, yeah. they get away from it after a while mm -hmm. but i feel like initially it gave me that feeling like oh hey this is going to be doing what i want it to do in in a fallout open world game and then it kind of fell off yeah. yeah yeah but because you didn't have that um i'm looking for my father or i got to save my son it didn't have that where it, it if you're doing anything that's divergent from that it didn't feel like it was working if you're just oh i'm just this uh delivery guy who is trying to figure out why someone shot me in the head and left me for dead it it gets you more like it feels more like, hey, I'm exploring for it. The expression itself, I guess, becomes that purpose uh, yeah. a little better. There's it a also little still feeds connection. into your character, right? And, yes. In that, if your character isn't very focused on trying to solve it, then that just means that your version of that character was a bit more laissez-faire about that idea, or right. didn't really care. You know, like there's, I often bring up like in Final Fantasy 15, it was so close. It was so close to being like one of my ideal open world games. In that, if they got rid of most of that story, and if it was truly you start at one end of the continent, and the goal is to get to the other end of the continent yeah. because you have to get there for Noctis's wedding, yeah, that would have been amazing. Uh -huh. Because then That's everything that was you going do to do at Me that too. point yeah. makes sense. If you yeah. stop and start fishing, if you decide to start doing monster hunt bounties, yeah. all of that goes into the idea of either you don't have enough money to get across the city because you need gas, right. or... Noctis doesn't want to actually become an adult and take responsibility right, yet. Exactly. And it still all fits. Instead, we got a story of, oh, there is horrible things happening. My kingdom is falling apart. I'm going to go fish for a while. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to tell no that sense. story. Yeah, so, exactly. So 
I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's that's brilliant. And as sort of our last sort of discussion point that I want to touch on before we end, um, why do you think? And we can use Final Fantasy 15 as an example. Why do you think they they decided instead of going well? We already have this road trip concept. We've built all the backstory for these characters for it. We have a destination for the road trip. We have this world. Why didn't they just go with your idea? Why did they throw in the? And, and I say this expecting a certain answer, but mm. I mean I'm still asking the question because I want us to talk about it. Why do you think they were like, yes, we have to have this this completely different storyline, uh, save the world, that kind of thing? Because it's a Final Fantasy game. Well, I think that there's I think that there's two reasons that this happens on either side. Either story get in the way of gameplay or vice versa. It's either that there is a story that a developer wants to tell and they decide, especially if we're talking the AAA space, it needs to be open world because then that gives more content because then that increases hours that games can be played, meaning yeah. that then, oh, we could get more sales and we can hit a broader audience and that's what the publisher wants. On the other hand, like what I think happened with Final Fantasy is I think that they wanted to do something that was kind of more open world and they wanted to kind of tell the story that we were talking about, but it was still Final Fantasy. Yeah. And, and they still wanted to point. try to tell a more, a, a stronger, more linear story. And then that's where the issue came in. They needed it to loop back around again. Yeah. And I would, my immediate thought was this. That's Bioware's I, problem. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, there, there's an element where you introduce a character. And you want that character to be a recurring character. You've you've hired the actor to do the voices. You've you've done these assets. You've done whatever it is. Yeah. We want to reuse that asset. And there's a practical element to that. So let's just say you've got a a, a hotel where you're going to stay, which is a thing in Final Fantasy 15. Um, you're going to want to use that hotel multiple times in that city, multiple times. Whereas if you're literally only going to stay there one night then you've created all this assets for something that you only got to see one time. We're going to get there. We're going to be at a place very soon, I think, where that's going to be something we can do. We're going to pull from the library. We're going to generate the city. We're going to be able to move on. But if you really want a game like that, you need to play Jalopy. You need to not mm. play yeah. Yeah. Final Fantasy fifteen. Yeah, and I think that the other side of it as well is... If they're trying to, again, if, if they're looking at it commercially, if they're trying to maximize their audience and get the most people interested, I can't tell you how many discussions I've had with people who, with people who just don't think about games the way that the people sitting around this table do, and that they don't feel or recognize that dissonance between the story and gameplay. Yeah, yeah. Um, or that even, if they do, they make a joke of it, like, oh, I should be fighting the monster sure. now. Sure, and even so, even in the idea of a friend of mine who is a games writer and has done it for games, mm -hmm. um, adores Skyrim, and it is his favorite game of all time. And when I bring up that dissonance... I mean, it's still of, one of my favorite if games. You so. were to, <laughs> if you were to take the story out of Skyrim, I think that you get an infinitely better game. Um, totally, right. totally agree. And he does not understand that. And I think that that's just simply a part of it as well, is just difference in audience opinions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that there's always going to be somebody who says, well, if you take a story out of a game, why am I playing it? And I totally understand that. Um, and I think that's why we get both kind of tacked in and trying to appease both sides mm -hmm. of the argument and both audiences. It has to do with player type. For me personally, my dream is I would love a fantasy game RPG with all of the companions that I could possibly have with skill trees and everything that does not have a story. Yeah. If you just toss me in the world and just say it's an open world D and D campaign, yeah. have fun. Mm -hmm. I, I think, but I know but that also won't sell. Yeah, because well, that's, people want their story. It, it, it may no not, matter how much it fits in or not. It may not, but we. But I mean, are we really going to know until we see like a big a big company put forth that level of effort and that level, you know, like the triple A polish on it with all of that content that, that you're talking about, like say Final Fantasy Road Trip and actually <laughs> released it and see, hey, maybe it would be a huge hit. We don't really know, but I do agree with you. And I think that you, what you were kind of touching on there is like the expectation, yeah. you know, players are expecting something. And so therefore, like, for example, the Final Fantasy name, there's an expectation that comes along with it. And I almost feel like if they had called it instead of Final Fantasy 15, it was Final Fantasy Road Trip. And it's like, hey, it's a spinoff of the Final Fantasy series, and you're going to go on a road trip. Yeah. They could have yeah. gotten away with doing that, I think, possibly. Right. Yeah. Now, would they have sold as many units as opposed to a mainline Final Fantasy? Probably, Probably not. not. Because there's people that will buy a mainline Final Fantasy based solely on the, on that 
lettering. They yeah. also wouldn't have gotten the budget to have built that game that yeah. size. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, they, prob- point. they probably would not have. Um, okay, so I, I guess we've kind of talked around this, this topic, and um, uh, I feel like we're just about at the end here. Are there any closing thoughts? Only this. Um, what I want is a string of pearls. Uh, it could be the road trip idea, but it mm. doesn't have to be. Mm. Think about your favorite novel series, which is a, a true series. I would mention Nero Wolf. I love the Nero Wolf detective okay. novel series. They are complete standalone stories unto themselves. So we're not talking like Harry Potter one through seven, where you read them in order. You're That's not talking about Lord of the Rings. I'm not talking like about Lord of the Rings, yeah. where Lord of the Rings technically has six books, if you will, because you know, it's one book that has six books in them. Um, no, not talking that I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the Hardy Boys, right? Okay. Everybody can okay. relate to the Hardy yeah. Boys. Each you can read any book from like the Hardy Sherlock Boys Holmes series or something. Yeah, yeah you, exactly. This is what I'm talking about. I want a game where I pick that up and I can go engage in a micro story, let's call it a short story within a given uh time or space and then uh you know, succeed or fail, then the story moves on into an unrelated additional other story. And I think that a mystery would be a great place to do that. And so what, what I'm was looking for in, in Detroit become human was that, mm. and that's not, well. <laughs> that's not what I got. Um, what I got with that was more episodic chapters in mm. a novel, not a collection of short stories. And, mm. and so that's not a complaint necessarily, even though it is for that game. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is what I really want is for an open world to really treat its little spaces as short stories, ongoing short stories. And some do that really, really well with, let's call them the side missions. Um, but then you also have the main line mission, whatever that is. Right. So in the case of, say... Skyrim, I would say you've got lots of little short stories happening all over the place mm-hmm. in that world. Rip out the main mission and you're yeah. there. And Absolutely. they're all, just about every, all of those uh, short stories are more interesting than that main mission, yeah, I think so. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point and I would love to see um, some designers take more take more of a risk and try something like that and see if it works because I do think that there's an audience for that. Oh, there is. And I feel that if, yeah. they, if they make it, if, if it's strong enough, I feel like they can do it, and or they could even go because I think Breath of the Wild is an example of of pretty much just about doing that. It's just that they still had the one goal that you could do right away, right. but then they just threw in all these other things that you could do that all tied back to the main goal. So that was if you do it cleverly enough, you can pretty much have kind of what Doc's talking about, sort of if it all ties back to the main quest. It's just very difficult to come up with. There's you know not too many stories you can do where they all tie back to that one thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I do you. think of the early Fallout though, yeah. where the ending the first, of yes. the game yes. shows you, uh, like it's it's a montage of all the places that you saw, and how they ended up. Um, if you've never seen the ending of Fallout One and Two, that's the way it's done, and it's brilliant. It's absolutely well, brilliant. You say the ending, but endings, yeah, yeah. But that's the point. <laughs> you see that an ending, an ending, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's always emergent, yes. And yes. and and you, it really re- reacts to everything you did or didn't do. Like if you encountered someone and didn't help them, it shows you, and they all died yeah. and blew away. Yeah. It's like, oh jeez. <laughs> it does a much better job of of that style, of, you know, letting you affect the world than any of the Bethesda games. Uh, fallout games have done yep. they just it, it yep. and a lot of that obviously it's because of of the expectation but also because of things like voice acting etc yeah um well cool. we've meandered in this open world for yes. long enough so. yes we have <laughs> um so i want to uh, thank everybody for joining us for this um episode episode number 131 of the backward dash compatible.com podcast uh, for our discussion on um how storytelling might detract from open world games or, or vice, vice versa. versa yeah um i'm jim i'm doc i'm nick Give me Doc Game. I'm Eric. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, everybody. That'll be 60 bucks. (laughs) We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. We're compatible.